For many of us, group projects and teamwork were the low point of our educational experience. For others, it was being asked to evaluate the work of our peers. I remember hating being asked to correct the French papers of my grade 11 peers because it felt like there was no way to do so without being mean. Now today we're going to talk about an online platform looking to not only make both of those things better for students, but to make them into a teaching tool in and of themselves. My name is Eric Bullman, I'm the communications person at the Canadian Psychological Association, and this is Mindful. Peer Scholar started in the psychology department of the University of Toronto and just a few short years later is now being used around the world from Belgium to Japan in classes including nursing, economics and English. How could it work for you and for your students? One of the creators of the platform joins me today to explain. My name is Steve Jordans. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, and I tend to teach the large intro psych course, although I've taught all sorts of psych courses during my time there. And you neglected to mention new CPA member, which and not a lot of people know this, but this podcast is actually just exists solely to recruit new members to the CPA. I invite <laughs> people worked. on and then badger them until they eventually become a member. So I, I'm chalking one up in my success column here. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got you got one in that column at least. <laughs> All right, terrific. Now, Peer Scholar, that's what we want to talk about here. Now, yeah. And I do extensive research for all of these podcast episodes. And in doing so, I went to the website, Peer Scholar. That's literally all the research that I did. As, and as <laughs> neither a peer nor a scholar, I wasn't entirely sure what it was that I was trying to do when I went there. So I'm hoping you can explain sort of the nuts and bolts of this platform to me. I know that it's for students and professionals, research, all the rest of this. But let's say I'm a student and I'm doing some research. How does Peer Scholar help me? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, it, it's kind of our baby. We're quite proud of it. And, and just to give a sense of how we view it, first of all, and then I'll walk you through a little bit. We do a whole bunch of research in, in my advanced learning technologies lab, and it's all our, our, our real kind of forte has been around skill development. We see this as, you know, we see with chat GPT and other things, there's there's so many things tech can do well. So if we want to pre prepare our students for the future, they need to do the things tech doesn't do well. And that's think critically, think creatively, communicate in a human way with each other, collaborate with other human beings to get things done. And so that's been a challenge for a long time. How can I take my very large class and nonetheless develop these skills in them. And so we've done a bunch of research in the lab and ultimately what Peer Scholar is, is the vehicle that allows us to bring that research to literally now classrooms all over the world. And it's really cool. It's actually a very simple process and it's one that teachers have used to some extent for years, knowing it works, but here's the mile high and then we can dive in as deep as we want. But the mile high is it's three steps. Step one is usually whatever a professor would do anyway in terms of an assignment. So at some point, students have been learning the material of the course, and at some point, the professor says, okay, I want you to use that knowledge you've been learning to create some novel composition. It could be a research report. It could be, you know, who knows, whatever, very different across disciplines, uh, and then submit that. And, and usually that's where it ends with students. But we stick on these two additional steps. Step two, they log in, and we now say, you know what, you're going to play the role of the teacher here you are going to see the work that some of your peers submitted. And usually we're talking about four to six or so. Uh, they'll be anonymously presented and randomly selected. So you won't know whose work that is, which is interesting for EDI sorts of reasons. You don't know the gender of the person. You don't know anything about their cultural background. And what we want you to do is give to help them uh, in two ways. First of all, highlight something you really liked. So give some good positive feedback. And the critical part of peer scholars, we teach them how to do these things right, um, which we could talk about if we want. But yeah, give positive feedback the right way and then give constructive feedback in the right way. Highlight some way that you see that their work could be even better. And now you have to do that for four different peers or six different peers. And, and I'll kind of like do a micro dive here for a moment to give you a, a connection. 
in order to do that, if I were reading your work and I wanted to give you some advice on how to be better, I have to, first of all, read carefully. I call that receptive communication, learning to shut up and listen to somebody else. Some of us aren't so good at that sometimes. Um, right. We got, we got to compare that with critical thought because we're trying to find, okay, are there points of, I'll call it points of weakness. Are there things here I could see that could be improved? Uh, once we find one, we have to then use creative thought do I have any good advice for this person? Can I see a way this could be improved? And now I have to do that reading through the entire thing. And maybe I find four potential points of weakness and I'm only supposed to communicate one. So then it's okay, which one of those four more critical thought? And then finally, expressive communication, expressing this to the student, you know, here's how I think you should do it. And we really work very hard with micro learning to teach them how to give constructive feedback without triggering the fight flight. Um, which is very right. difficult to do. Uh, yes. And that's sort of the, that's what makes the whole feedback thing so challenging, but it also makes it such a rich learning environment. So at any rate, so students are doing this peer by peer, exercising all of these skills in a very structured way. Um, and then the last peer is their work. And so we say, okay, you've just gotten really good at you know ripping apart the work of your peers. Now look at yours. And, and we all suck at that to begin with. We all think our work looks great. But after we've just sort of had that critical mindset, we can often see our work a little differently, especially because we've seen now other students work. So we have a sense of how ours compares. So that's good for metacognitive kind of stuff. Okay, that's step two. Right. Now, finally, step three <laughs> is kind of the capstone of the peer uh, scholar experience and it's what some other peer assessment systems I think um, lack. And that is we really ultimately want to teach students how to negotiate the negative emotions of constructive feedback and actually learn from it. It's, it's kind of like that concept of the growth mindset that Carol Dweck talks about. But where I diverge from Carol is, is she suggested early on that if we just use the right words and have the right attitude around students that this growth mindset will emerge. I argue that the growth mindset is in fact not natural, no more natural than playing a guitar. That doesn't mean people can't play guitar, but you have to teach them how to do it. You have to give them the practice. And that's what phase three is about. So students see the feedback that peers have given them. We walk them through an analysis of the feedback, teaching them how to recognize the fight flight reflex when it happens and how to not let it get in their way. So ultimately they're going through each bit of feedback that way. And after they've done that, we say, okay, now you can go ahead and revise your work before the prof sees it. You can go ahead and, and take that feedback and use it what we call formatively um, to actually make your work better. And that's where a lot of the real rich learning happens. Uh, any of us who have had reviews of our papers know that reviewers are idiots until <laughs> the moment we start actually implementing their suggestions. And then when we do, we realize, wow, my paper's getting better. Those idiots are actually making my paper better. And <laughs> at some point we realize, oh, they weren't idiots. They were very useful people. And students go through that same thing. And, and by the time they get there, they start to see the point of learning how to negotiate the feedback, that it does actually result in them doing better quality work and ultimately, of course, getting a better grade in, in the course. And then the instructors often, they grade the final product, but they often also grade the process. They will grade the quality of the feedback students are giving, and, and they'll sometimes mm -hmm. grade the appropriateness of their revision. And so that's the basic process. It's just about you know students giving feedback to others and then learning from feedback themselves. But we scaffold it really heavily and we just sort of have one person said, this thing is just layered in, in uh, evidence-based pedagogy. And we're like, yeah, <laughs> everything we know is there. <laughs> so that's why we're quite proud of it. So without this, a student would just write a paper, submit it to the prof, and then the prof would read it and grade it. And that would be the whole process. It sounds to me like you've created a lot yep. more work for professors. Several extra oh. <laughs> steps along the way. You're, you're now teaching additional things and grading on additional things that you otherwise wouldn't be doing. Well, so, so yes and no. So it is kind of funny. At, at one point, you know, when we were talking to people about marketing this thing, and I'm a prof, I'm not a business guy. So you go reach for advice. And one of the things people say, well, with the educational market, your message must be, this will make your life easier. Um, right. And, and you you know, say that about your product. I'm like, oh, I can't say that about my product. It won't make your life easier, but it doesn't really make it harder. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, I would push back a, a against a couple of things there. One is the professors usually end up loving the papers more, like it's it's better quality work. So they so they find that actually better. As far as grading the process, that can be done 
quite easily. Um, what was, I was trying to remember the first the first way you said it, it made their lives uh, more difficult. But um, it is. I just it feel is, like it's extra work. I'm not going to say it's more difficult as such. It just feels yeah. like you're doing a little more work than you otherwise would. There is the question of setting up the activity, which is relatively easy. But at first, you know, new new technologies are always a little intimidating. So we work hard to onboard people. Once they've done one or two, it's like cool. Um, then you know they get to really see the students going through this process, which a lot of instructors like. I don't think it takes any more time to grade because we have a lot of ways of of uh, within the tool of making that easy to do. And you can also, by the way, use peer grades. So I'll give you an example of that because we try to do everything very cyclically. So in, in the assess phase, the second phase, students are taught how to give good constructive feedback. They're first taught about the fight flight reflex. And, and by the way, I'll just mention videos.peerscholar.com. If anybody wants to see these micro learning uh, artifacts and use them, they're, they're all available there. And so we teach them, hey, here's why it's so challenging to give good feedback. And now here are six tips to have in mind when you do it to try to meet that challenge. When the student then receives the feedback, we give a rubric with those six things and we say, okay, how well did Eric, they don't know it's Eric, but how right. well did Eric, you know, follow this rubric in, in your feedback? We also ask them, by the way, how, how much negative emotion did it cause you to read his feedback? How, what was his point? You know, oh, okay. in your own words, restate his own point. And so you as a feedback giver, if you give feedback to say four to six people, you ultimately see their feedback on your feedback. And we can okay. actually use that quantitatively. So we can, in an automated way, you know, take those rubrics and say, oh, students, the student's reaction to your feedback was whatever. And that can be part of the grade. So there's an option of, of using peer ratings as, as part of the grades in some cases, um, which can, you know, help with that, with the grading sort of aspect of it. The real place we add work, and this is what we're worried, like faculty, I don't think it really increases their workload much. I would say a little. It's not not going to decrease. I'm not going to go there. Uh, right. But uh, for students, you know, that was our worry. We are asking a lot of students. It takes a lot of time. It takes real concerted effort to go through and do this. And we always motivate them every step. So, so let me throw out some psychology. We're in a psychology group here. Self-determination theory is is critical to everything we do. And, and if people don't know it, it's, it's a theory I think all psychologists should know. And it just essentially says, if you want to engage somebody in some experience, there's three needs you have to meet. The first is autonomy. They have to be part of that experience because they see value to themselves, that they're doing it for some sort of personal reason, not because someone told them to do it. Right. If they're doing it because they see. So we always have a video that says, why should you care about learning to give good feedback? Why should you care about being able to learn from feedback? And, and we make the case for them of how this is going to benefit them down the line. And so that's always part of it. But then the next one is competence. And, and that's where we work really hard in our videos to make them, we don't just throw them in, you know, give feedback and they don't know how to give good feedback and then they don't like it. We try to really give them a clear sense, get their competence high so that they feel really comfortable doing it. We've done a lot of research with Peer Scholar, with professors and students. And the biggest worry we had is that students were going to say, this is just too much work. Right. I don't like this. I don't want this uh, a lot. And, and we see that in other active learning situations. We think it's active learning. We think it's great. They think it's unfamiliar, weird work. And so do, would they think that for Peer Scholar? And the good news is they don't. Two things they absolutely love about the process. They love seeing the work of their fellow peers. And, and it kind of makes you kind of sit back and go, Man, you know, we've been in classrooms where teachers asked us to do something and we've worked really hard and we've done it and a bunch of other people have too. And we never see, you know, all these other things we could learn from are sitting there in the classroom and we don't ever see them. And it turns out that students love to be able to see that other work and sense how their work compares. The second thing is the one I mentioned. When they revise their work and it feels better, they're like, okay, this was worth it. And so students by and large really endorse the process. They they will mostly, you know, on a, on a seven point Likert scale, they'll be somewhere around the five or six on, this should be part of every course I take. That tends to be the averages we get. And faculty, the nice thing is faculty who use it say, I could see it. I could see the learning benefit that was happening. It all made sense. It passes the smell. It's, it's nice because it's, it's got all this research behind it. We can tell you all the papers and all that stuff. But for any educator, they just, this is the sniff test. Like, yep. Yeah. This makes sense. I understand how this works. And once they use it once, they tend to want to continue using it. So that that's what's heartening for us because it is a little extra work for the profs, a lot of extra work for the students, 
but there's no pushback from it. They see the value and they want more. And, and that's you know extremely heartening for us. Well, videos.peerscholar.com. I'm going to put that in the show notes so anyone who's listening cool. now can go there and click on it. You said that students love this idea that all of a sudden now you can see some of the work that your fellow classmates are doing. All of you have presumably been assigned a very similar assignment and therefore everyone else is doing something that is similar to the work you're doing. Is this a class by class type of thing, right? If I sign up to Peer Scholar, I'm in Steve Jordan's class and I have been assigned to write an essay on self-determination, right? And so I, I submit that and then I read stuff from my peers. Am I reading from my peers in my same class or am I assigned something from the University of Calgary where they're doing a completely different? Yeah, no, it would typically be within a class and, and it would be uh, that there's this fancy stuff under the hood about how peers are assigned to each other and all that stuff, but you can almost imagine it's essentially a random process. So when you log in, you're going to see the work of some random other sets of students, but yes, in your class. Um, and you will ultimately be assessed by students in your class. The, those may not be the same group. Like you may not be assessing the same people that are assessing you, but right. generally, yeah, it goes, it goes within a class situation. Uh, we also support, by the way, both individual students work where all the students are working as individuals, but we have a, a bunch of uh, modules for teamwork as well. And in fact, you know, at videos.peerscholar.com, you can find some videos where we support students uh, when they're in teams. Cause this, this has become a, um, I'll call it a pet peeve, um, if you were. We know of all these great educational practices. For example, we know how good teamwork can be, how, how important it can be for developing collaboration skills and communication skills among students. But so often we just throw them into a team and do it badly. And they have a horrible experience and they don't enjoy it and they don't see the value of it. And so for me, you know, we spend a lot of time saying, okay, yes, there's the educational thing, teamwork. Now, how do we really support the students and make sure, you know, A, they do see the value, the autonomy part, but B, that they really understand the challenges. And so we have a video, here's why it's so tough to work in teams. This is why so often it falls apart. But then we follow that with, okay, how can you avoid those things from happening? Here are some strategies and tips that right from the get-go, if you employ these things, then it'll go a lot smoother. And so when we do that, suddenly students are finding teamwork more enjoyable and, and they're getting the most of it. And I think some you know, sometimes we as educators fall flat that way. We throw students in over their head, you know, even though we should know about the zone of proximal development, it's been around for a long time. We, we know the dangers of asking too much of our students, but I think we still do it um, too often. And so we're trying to use a lot of micro learning to kind of teach them in context. Um, and, and it's part of a principle we call knowledge informed practice. So let's teach them something like, here's how to give good feedback, but then immediately say, okay, now do it. Uh, and do it repeatedly. Um, and so, you know, before that knowledge gets a little stale, Ebbinghaus, you know, that knowledge goes away pretty quickly if we just yeah. leave it there. Um, so let's get them practicing, get them using it. And that's sort of a core principle that we weave all through uh, the tech. Well, that's actually, I'm wondering if you can give me a, an example of one of the things that makes teamwork better, that makes it more useful, right? It has to be more than just, you know, don't be the guy who doesn't show up and doesn't do the work, right? It, 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 there's got to be more to it. So can you give me an example of how this helps a team? Part of it often involves, you know, the, we, we can talk about the difference between teamwork and group work or group work. Sometimes it's a, it's a task where people are able to carve it into, okay, there's four of us. We'll carve on four different chunks. You do chunk one, I'll do chunk two, and then we'll bring it all together and, and we'll call that a project. That's more group work. Teamwork is supposed to be where you're literally, you know, yes, maybe you all have responsibilities in the team and yes, maybe they're all different, but they involve a much more synergistic interaction between people so that you know what somebody else is doing because it's going to come to you and you're going to do your thing. And so the first thing is come up with a context that, that actually fits that. And so one of my favorites for teamwork uh, in my 1800 student intro psych class is um, the last thing I do at the end is always a work integrated. And I think we spoke about the homelessness um, one that we that we did a few years ago. Yes. Um, this year was Swab the World. So Swab the World is an organization where they're trying to get more 
non-Caucasian stem cells in the Canadian stem cell database. Right now it's over 70% Caucasian and, and race and culture matter when you need a stem cell match. And so mm. right now, if you're not Caucasian, there are not many stem cells. And there's this amazing person named Mai Dong, head of Swab the World. If anybody wants to do a class project with her, I know she would love it. And she came into the class, she talked about this problem. And then we said, okay, to the students, you guys are now gonna work team as teams, but you're each gonna be like a consulting company that's going to ultimately produce a public service announcement to try to raise awareness around this issue. And, and you guys are from these communities she's trying to reach. You know, you know what some of the what some of the stigmas might be that a community might have around this, what some of the, the appropriate ways of reaching them. Use what you're learning in this course. Use the knowledge that you brought to this course and then work together to create this thing that you're proud of. That you almost need a little bit of that as a teamwork. You need to, you know, have these four people thinking, okay, we want to do something cool. And so I think that authenticity of the of the problem, especially because teamwork is really about preparing students for success post graduation, where we do everything in teams, pretty much. And and so the more authentic that situation can be, the better. But then of course, there's also supporting them when they come up with roles. Well, what are roles you might choose in your team? How might that work? And so, you know, giving a lot more guidance and structure really kind of helps it work. And, and once they have a great experience, they come out the other side and it's like, that was great. Then it's like, yeah, that's what good teamwork feels like. It doesn't always feel like that, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but when it feels good, it feels really good. And so, you know, those are some of the concepts. A lot of the other ones you'll see in that video in terms of highlighting the challenges and, and really trying to be honest with students about, you know, why do so many students hate teamwork? Well, because they run into one of these, but if you can avoid them, then it's then it's a whole different story and you'll leave here knowing how to avoid them in the future and that's going to make you succeed in your relationships and, and your work environment etc we always have an eye towards that post graduation in, in everything we do and and you know preparing in fact let me just go here real quick one of the things i like to say to students is if i've done my job it's not just that you'll know psychology well when you're in that job interview for a job you really want you will be able to negotiate that situation. And that involves, you know, a, a communicating with other individuals, listening, all the things I described to you just a moment, you know, listening very carefully when they ask a question, being able to think critically on the fly, being able to think creatively, pro providing a nice answer that's sensical and, and connects with the question. If you can do those things, that's what's going to get you the things you really want in life. So it's not just knowledge, you need to focus on those skills. And I spend a lot of time, you know, harping on that point. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you spend time harping on that to your class of 1,800, a, a massive undergrad class. Uh, how many of those 1,800 are using Peer Scholar? Oh they, oh, they all use it. It's it's all part of our, so in, in my class, they run into it twice. Um, but the second time is, is that context I've just been talking to you about. So we use that, like once they create a public service announcement, we have like 400 of them because there's 400 groups of four. And so they first peer assess one another's work so that we can get to like a top 10. And so they're actually doing team-based peer assessment. And if I can just mention that for, for a moment, the interesting thing there is imagine we now, and by we, I mean me and the three members of my team are seeing the work that your team did. And we read the work that your team did. And now we have to give you some constructive feedback. Well, what are we going to say? Well, we'd better talk about that. And so suddenly right. outside of the platform, the idea is we have to say, well, I think we should do that. Maybe this, maybe that. We have to debate some of these ideas. We have eventually have to reach convergence and say, okay, this is what we really want to say. You know, those are all those collaboration skills that we want students to experience. And, you know, for me, skills only build with repetition and practice, good repetition, good practice, and, and they build. And so in that context, that's, that's sort of where, where they run into it. Um, but before that, by about chapter two in most of our intro psych classes, when they're learning about the scientific method and we expose them to their first primary source research article, we use Peer Scholar there too, for them to summarize the article, identify the critical variables, but also to do that next step, which I think is important, to have some creative thought. If you were the researcher, what would you do next? And often students are never asked that question. Uh, they find it challenging. Uh, they find it 
intimidating. Uh, a lot of first year students, you're going to ask me to pretend I'm a scientist and come up with a, a good hypothesis to follow up next. But they also, again, love seeing each other's hypotheses and, and kind of thinking about them and assessing them. So, so in my class, they hit it twice. At U of T, by the way, it's now used of roughly 100 courses a term. So students in my class may also run into it in a variety of other classes as they go from one to another. And I'm curious about those other classes too. The you know, I see the benefit certainly from a psychological standpoint. Obviously, these skills are uh, very useful for people who do all kinds of higher education academic work. You know, what kind of other programs are really buying into this a lot right now? Like who's really making use of this outside of psychology? Oh, it's, it's such a funny question to answer because people ask me that question and we have a nice admin dash now, so we can actually see sort of university by university where are the pockets and, and some of them are very surprising. At, at U of T, for example, the biggest pocket is in economics, which we don't see in other, in other uh, universities necessarily. And it wouldn't be the first thing that would come to mind. You know, economics feels like things where there's right answers and how do you peer assess someone, you know, is two plus two equal four away? Yes, it does. Um, but no, these profs are finding very clever ways of, of focusing more on the theoretical aspects of economics and getting students to think uh, in those sorts of ways. But literally, you know, from, from institution to institution, as I think of another institution, they're using it heavily in their nursing program, which is really cool because Peer Scholar doesn't just involve written communication. In that case, nurses have to learn these basic skills, these physical, you know, forget critical thinking, you got to learn how to suture a wound. The way they're now doing it, they used to have an expert, one expert with a room full of people, and that expert would be constantly touring and sort of watching somebody do something and give feedback. Now they have rounds of peer assessment where they videotape themselves doing it. Um, I, I always think of that, you know, bandaging them the head or that you see to <laughs> bandage your dog's head or something and do it right and do it and do a video and save that. And then they've, you know, peer assess each other and say, oh, you did that really well, but you didn't do that. You didn't do that. And so after rounds of peer assessment, then the expert can chime in and they find that it's a much more effective use of that expert's time, that they tend to be seeing work that's already fairly developed. And that's where the expert can really come into play and, you know, add that little extra touch. So in that case, yeah, it's all about nursing. In a university in Belgium, they love the teamwork stuff and they do just a ton of, of teamwork things there. And that tends to be the obvious aspects like engineering, but it's also in things like English. They, they literally have teamwork across the board. Uh, and so we see that build up. So it's hard to give a single answer. And it's certainly that answer isn't psychology. It was born in psychology, but it's, it's literally all over the board right up to, well, where as low as grade seven schools in, in especially Asia and Holland, we're big in Japan, sort of, we're not big in Japan, but we're big in Asia other than Japan. Um, and, uh, and, um, up to like med school, U of T uses it in the graduate program. So, so it really is very flexible. It'll fit a lot of educational contexts. If somebody's listening to this, they're a professor at a university, they're hearing about this for the first time, they'd like to implement this with their class. How do they go about doing that? Who signs up for it and how do they get their students involved? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sales pitch. Weird. <laughs> it's so weird, weird to be a prop doing this stuff. But yeah, um, you know, a, a couple of ways. So first of all, the first step would be just to reach out to your teaching and learning center and maybe it's already available um, to you. So typically our, our end game, I guess you'd say, would be to work with a teaching and learning center where we can offer the webinars and everything else we offer to support. But that's the end game. And quite often that begins with a professor or two or a department that are interested in and try it out. And then it eventually kind of reaches a, a bigger mass. So so certainly if there's anybody in a teaching and learning kind of thing, we'll, we'll happily demo and chat at any point, um, you know, more than happy to do that. But also if it's an individual professor, reach out. We can only be successful if literally on the individual professor level, they get it, they like it, they appreciate it. And, and that's where it all starts. And so if, if there is no peer scholar at your institution right now, reach out, let's, let's find a way to get you using it. And, and that may mean no costs you know, whatever involved. Um, quite often, if a professor is willing to give it a real honest, serious uh, shot, then we would like them to give it a try. They become the sort of first tire kicker. Right. And then we go and then we go from there, you know, wherever that may go. So if you're interested, I I'm steve.jordans at utoronto.ca or steve at peerscholar.com if you want it to be a little easier. Reach out, let's chat. 
when I when I talk about these things, I, I talk a lot about constructive feedback and the challenge of constructive feedback, but also that you can use it to develop these skills. And all of that's true. But I also like, and and we teach students this too. And I always like to mention to people, don't forget about positive feedback. Positive feedback has none of those challenges. We accept positive feedback with open arms. We will just take it all in. But it's really important that it be delivered properly. And and the most important thing is that it be specific. That, you know, I, I could just tell you, Eric, you're a fantastic podcast host. I enjoyed this. And, and that'll make you feel good. But that's it, right? But if I can say, wow, the way you pushed me to think about this or, or your questions that were of this style really kind of brought out what I wanted to say, that more specificity you're going to grab and you're going to say, oh, yeah, oh, those are cool questions, right? Okay, I'm going to bring more of those into my repertoire. And that's probably the easiest way to kind of get people on track with the sort of behavior you'd like to, to see is to use positive reinforcement in an informed, intentional way. And we try to get students doing that too. So it's not all about here's how your work could be better, but also here's something you're really good at now. This is fairly new, right? This is only in the last couple of years, maybe a year and a half. I, I think. Yeah, we've been sort of at it for three years, but seriously, a year and a half, two years. Yeah. Right. So you don't have any long term data in the sense that you don't have any students that went through this and are now professionals in their career 10 years in Correct. and how well this has helped them. Uh, I'm wondering if you can just give me maybe some examples or tell me about some of the feedback you've received. So how has this helped people in the two years since they started doing this? Uh, do people tell you, hey, now I can do this better. Now this is, a, you know, do they give you that constructive and positive feedback? Yeah. So, so a couple of things I can say on that. So first of all, we can do a step better from that. You're right. We don't have the longitudinal data, um, which we hope to really see, you know, will this help them land that interview? That's what, I, what I'd really love to see. But we do have shorter term data from research we've done. And if, if anybody searches my name, Jordan's with this weird acronym, HECO, H-E-Q-C-O, which was the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, they used to commission research on various things and they commissioned us to do a bunch of research on Peer Scholar to answer that question, efficacy especially, efficacy and usability. Does it really do what you guys say and is it easy enough to use that it will scale widely? Um, and from that research, so there's a bunch of reports online that you can find, but I'll give you a couple of little tastes of, of things we did. And one of them is when students submitted their work originally, we said, Okay, if you were going to give this a grade out of 10, what grade would you give it? And by the way, they give it about one and a half higher than it deserves. That's at least in the West. We overestimate the quality of our work all the time. And by <laughs> deserves, do you mean what the professor would have given it? As the, a grade? The, the grade it would alternately. Yes, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Professor TA. Um, but now when they go into this assess phase, they see in this in that experiment was five of their fellow peers work. And they went through that process of giving feedback. And we say, okay, now look at your work. We asked you this question before, but we're going to ask it again and try to think of it with a fresh mind. You know, on a, on a scale of one to 10, what do you now think it deserves? What's the grade it deserves? And we've found that that overestimate drops from 1.5 above to 0.6. And that's just with one exposure to, to fellow student work. So, so that's something about the sort of metacognitive signal. But the really cocky thing we've done, <laughs> I'll mention this in one of our papers, is we have a formula for critical thought, which is ridiculous. I mean, critical thought is this big thing, but we have tried to boil it down. And, and what we did is we boiled it down to something we call quality-based discrimination. Can a student tell the difference between a good exemplar of work and a not so good exemplar? And specifically, if we ask them to rate the exemplars while they're giving feedback, so we you don't have to do that, but you can, how closely can they match the ratings that an instructor would give those pieces? Can they discriminate and give good marks to the ones the instructor thinks is good and not so good to the others? So we have tracked people across three peer scholar activities. We have a proper control group for the third. It's a lot to sort of describe. But basically what we found is their quality-based discrimination or, or better put their error, how far they are off from the expert gradually declines with every peer scholar activity they do. So they're gaining the ability to see the difference between good and bad. And, and we claim that's the core of critical thought. That's, wh that's where it kind of starts. So we certainly have data like that. We certainly have data saying students you know, value it, want, want more of it, but you're absolutely right. In our dream data, we now have a set of private schools in South Asia that are using it starting at grade seven through grade 12 in every class, every course context the students take. 
And those are the students that I really want to see come out the other end of that and, and see, you know, what they're doing. So we're starting that longitudinal research project there, but that's going to take a while. I may be retired by the time all the data is <laughs> in, but, but, but that's the cool, that's the ultimate goal for sure. You're right. That is cool. And yeah, I imagine that, you know, the ability to assess the quality of a thing must be a lifelong pursuit. I'm just thinking of a, video i saw yep. tv program where they had itzak perlman and another famous violinist on uh, and had them try yep. to tell whether or not the violin that was being played was a really high-end expensive one a cheap one or a stradivarius and no one could yep. pick out the stradivarius because even though you are an expert and you spent your whole life it just you know it, it, the name is a little bit bigger than the actual difference in quality between another very high-end violin right especially in the right hands yes. Jimi hendrix could make any guitar sound fantastic a hundred percent he could no yeah. doubt thank you to dr steve jordans for joining me today on mindful and to you for listening downloading and leaving a review I put links to most of what we discussed in the show notes, so if you're interested in Peer Scholar or in Swab the World, please check those out. Mindful is written, hosted, and published by me, Eric Bowman. Jamie Montgomery edits and produces the program, and our theme song is Avenues by David Taylor. <laughs>